Hola, um, buena tarde. Hello, good afternoon. I'm going to speak in Spanish. However, we have uh, quite a bilingual panel, so we'll mix so languages. So let me apologize on behalf of the members of the panel. Today, we have the amazing pleasure to talk about creative coding. I want to share with you my presentation. Humbly, let me apologize because I have a loads of doubts. I don't have any kind of a proficiency when dealing with creative coding. And I'm not a primary school teacher or secondary school teacher. I work as a university teacher at the Faculty of Communication Studies. I do love to teach and to share my knowledge. I'm quite a hands-on person and I work from Correa, a city at the outskirts of Barcelona. And we boost several projects amongst teachers, students, secondary school students, and the years before the university. So I don't know why, suddenly I fell into a rabbit hole and I was completely immersed in the world of labs. I had the pleasure and I was mesmerized because I was able to live several experiences with the creative coding. I was finishing my communication studies and I was starting my PhD in media labs because I really liked the relationship between technology, society, and suddenly I found that City Lab existed and it was like an adventure to me. I don't know if you know this idea of a Narcissus. Okay, Narcissus, well, looks himself as a mirror. He sees himself reflected in water like it's happening to us now with our screen. He doesn't eat, he doesn't drink water at all. And finally, he falls and he drones into the water. But suddenly, he experiences a metamorphosis. This is what happened to me. Once you reach this world, the world of technology and the environment of coding, and suddenly you belong to this environment of gods and heroes that allow you to change yourself and to experience like this metamorphosis. And I was totally fascinated with all the possibilities that I could witness. I learned loads about uh, different media labs in uh, France, in Translabi, in many other media labs, uh, mainly French colleagues in uh, Media Proud in Madrid. So. I experience many incredible things. And I was lucky enough because we suddenly began in my organization in City Lab together with EduLab, we began this journey to teach kids and children to coding. So infinite opportunities, infinite chances to experience activities with my colleagues, uh, you know them, Jose, Nina, before it was with us, Bernard, Jordi, Delgado, you know, they were my mentors. And I had so much fun with them. I learned a lot with them. So we brought to primary schools in Cornea in a very passionate manner, robotics and coding. So. Having said this, let me tell you something, but I'm going backwards again. So that's another flashback of my life. When I was finishing high school, 
I studied technology. And today I was having a conversation with my parents and they told me that I, they, that I didn't want to study technology. I looked all the list of uh, careers related with technology. I didn't know what to do. I didn't felt any connection at all. I didn't feel attracted. If I had known by that time that it was possible to code, to program technology together with the creativity, I'll be there. But I don't know why. By that time, this didn't happen. Therefore, my journey was a little bit longer than I expected. But I'm not complaining here because I had a lot of fun in the arts of faculty in a Masana school and also together at City Lab. So it was fun. It was quite an interesting journey to me. And I must be deeply thankful to Mariona and all M school uh, team. I must be deeply thankful to you because uh, you, the ones that are on the other side, you teachers working with boys and girls and the young people, because this is what I really wanted for my life. I wanted that, and you are working for the, the young people today not to suffer what I suffer. Therefore, we need to write in capital letters the creative aspect of creative coding. Why? Because in this creative arena, we can make people to feel attracted, to be passionate. We can make young people to feel the attraction, to learn coding, and to feel pulled by technology. We can let them learn to program as artists. What does this mean? This means to explore mistakes. This means to better understand coding as an artistic mean to find the limitations and not fighting for coding, but looking for a new way of expression. This means to learn mathematics, to understand mathematics, but to know how to create generative art. Why not? So this idea that has to do, and I have to say it in Catalan, this idea of spreading and to broaden the impact of creative technologies, of creative coding, to learn to program from creativity in a cross-linked manner, interconnected many areas and fields and disciplines. It is crystal clear that today and in the future, we will have a whole area of humanities and art where programming will be capital, will be something vital. So we are facing these new opportunities. We must try to convince our colleagues, such as Elena did. Elena, she's an English teacher and she uses creative coding in the classroom. So we can have humanity subjects, uh, we can use data, we can let students know about history, we can share what happened in our lives, the things that are so vital for social sciences. We can use coding to create art, to be creative, right? So we are facing right now a very big opportunity to pull all our colleagues to this adventure and try to make our best for them to be with us. And today we should think about new possibilities. Today we'll be witnessing amazing projects. What would be Media Labs if Arduino didn't exist in the past? All the possibilities that he brought and the way he worked with free hardware free hardware that was useful for him to boost and to strengthen the education trends. And Nerea is going to talk about this trend because they began with this project many years ago, right? And it spread all over the place. And it's such an amazing 
project. So thanks to Arduino, but not only with Arduino, because the tool ecosystem that we have in our hands, it's amazing. We have in Catalonia microblogs, microbits. We have such an array of uh, tools that are so cool and uh, languages and environments and uh, hardware that it's available to buy in a creative coding and a physical computing that I can see in the future boys and girls making this creative art. I can see them sculpting things without a purpose, but they, the sculptures will have light and sound. Maybe the sculptures would be robots. This is a picture of an Arduino project. It's an amazing project and really reminds me this exhibition that we can see at the CCCB Museum in Barcelona, which is an amazing exhibition. So let's bear in mind these projects, right? It's not the purpose. It's more to let boys and girls to develop their emotional skills with this interconnectivity world, such as generative art. I do remember when Bernard told us about uh, bitter blocks and uh, different uh, projects. So he was like an artist, engineers, artists working together. At the end of the day, I don't know what you think, but you can work with your body, you can work in individually, you can express yourself, and also you can work in problem resolution because, you know, in order to solve artistic problems, you need to master coding. So. We had a loads of uh, shapes, uh, fractals and uh, designs and drawings, robots that are able to draw. It was amazing. So it's like Alice in Wonderland, right? But after that, in this amazing journey, in this amazing adventure, I can find different artists working in urban media art. So screens are not anymore computer screens. We do have sculptures in public spaces with the projections in the facades in different uh, buildings of the city. So this is something amazing. When I saw these masterpieces, I was totally old. So I thought maybe this could do it at a city lab level and to work together with the boys and girls. And the Edelab team, they were able to create an application to work with the windows of this city lab and the video mapping, right? The live coding, all these opportunities, they are in the field of creativity. So we must say it in capital letters, right? With shining letters. However, I do feel that in fairs, in different contests that we have to stimulate robotics and coding in schools, I can see more room for digital art to grow and to get connected with the art uh, subjects and to be together with artists. There are some uh, disciplines uh, such as storytelling and Fran talked about how to make dance robots from a chaotic uh, situation. So today we have the chance to be together with four different individuals that will make us to be closer to this adventure. This is not science fiction anymore. This is something that is happening now. We can learn a lot from other people. And beyond Nerea, Elena, Eru, and Carolina, uh, members of the panel that will share amazing ideas with you, I'd like you to think about it, to think about different artists, different people, and always with a gender perspective. I'm going to talk about girls, right? Uh, I do apologize, my dear male friends. I do admire you a lot, but I'm going to share with you some artists that are female artists, right? female women that are making their best to match creative coding and education. I'm thinking about Susana Tesconi, Irma Villa. They are in the multimedia, UOC, Open University of Catalonia studies. 
and she was the first one that studied multimedia. Uh, and Susanna, she's also an amazing artist, how she was able to put together critical thinking design. But we also have other artists such as Alba G. Corral, which it really is amazing. I always say, wow, I don't know if you watch her works and masterpieces, they are amazing. She plays music, she works with musicians, and also Monica Ricic, and the different robots that she creates and builds. Also Mariona from Socotec, Rocio from Robotica, and my dear colleague Nina Coyle at City Lab. I know that there are many others. Many of them are not in this list, but I really wanted to share all the women working in this field. I had to mention them. So with this humbly introduction, I put all my heart into the world of education and coding and creative coding, right? So I'm really moved. I'm so happy to introduce the next speaker right now because Edward is working in a series of uh, amazing projects. I saw him in several presentations and he's working with this education perspective, connecting brain, hands, heart, and he's got loads of projects in India that really impacted to me. And the last projects in how he connects art, coding, programming, it's something amazing. So, Edu, I don't know if I forgot something else in order to introduce all your work, but please, I want to stop sharing because the floor is yours. It's your turn, Edu. It will be a pleasure to listen to your all your experience. Thank you so much, Laia, for your kind introductory words. Thank you very much to Socotec and M schools. Thank you very much for having invited me. I'm going to share the screen. Let me know if you don't see it. Okay, Laia already introduced myself. I come from the University of Girona. I am representing a group that it's called U Digital Edo and a new chair that is called Chair Techne. In both groups, in the chair and in the dig U Digital group, we design uh, learning experiences, workshops, activities, usually for uh, children and adults, um, putting together technology, science, art, to boost this technology, critical thinking, curiosity, empathy, always aiming at working with vulnerable uh, communities. She talked about the work that we made in India. In this uh, presentation, you will see loads of pictures that we took in Southern India. So you will see loads of children from Southern India. Let me tell you that uh, the panel is dealing with a very interesting uh, subject, creative coding and hacking education, how to use education to hack education, to transform education. I'm a, an engineer, an IT engineer, and from 2005, for more than 16 years, I'm working with uh, teaching children to coding amongst many other things. So for many years, I've been reflecting on why we should teach children to coding. It is true that nowadays it's something fashionable. In the last decade, we saw like an explosion of uh, teaching children coding. We have loads of programs, uh, public institutions, loads of uh, corporations working in the, this uh, market, right? I'm quite a critical uh, person when dealing with the different uh, point of views. And I'd like to vindicate the role that the first one played when we thought about teaching children uh, coding. Because many times they are too much pragmatic. We say to ourselves, we must teach children to uh, programming. Uh, therefore, they will develop uh, some skills for future jobs and for uh, nowadays uh, professions and careers. But if we only get this idea, that's not enough, guys. What I would really like 
through my presentation, it is to vindicate and to lobby to protect the original ideas that we, as a pioneers, we had to, in order to learn coding to children. I'm telling you that this is a last decade fashion, but in reality, we can see many other people, such as Ewan Popper, that in 1967, so many years ago, he was able to create a, a coding language logo. It was the first language. It was the previous language before Scratch, the language that we all know. So at the end of the 60s, the beginning of the 70s, why they thought that it was important to teach coding to children? They thought that make children programming will help them to better articulate their thinking. It is a proper sentence to learn to master your own thinking process to be much more precise when dealing with the complex processes. So if you're able to learn coding, you are learning the way you think. And this is so cool because this allows you to better develop metacognitive skills, which is so good for your mind. So this is my vindication, coding, programming as a mean of expression, programming and technology as a mean to express ourselves in a creative manner. So this is the discourse that today MIT students and professors have, the ones that developed Scratch. And finally, I'd like to show at the end of the presentation, I won't have time to share all my ideas with you because it's gonna be a very short presentation. I'd like to offer you some basic ideas of the main projects that we are developing in our chair and in our group. The first idea that I wanted to share, it is this idea of uh, programming and coding as a creative activity, right? This is the, the title of our panel, Creative Coding. Everything that Laia mentioned before has to do with this picture. We have the stereotype and a stereotype that we must break down. Sometimes we think that coding is only related with analytic thinking, with the mathematics and logics. Nothing has to do with that. For sure, there is a uh, great relationship with logics and mathematics but in coding we can see loads of creativity if you launch a challenge that has to be solved through coding in a classroom right whether you look you work individually or collectively you will see different solutions thanks to coding you will find very different solutions and many platforms they are designed for this to happen such as is the case of scratch which is a very powerful tool. So this is the first idea I wanted to share with you. These are the first five ideas that I, I wrote in a, an article, in a paper that I, it was published in the Journal of Education, but I think that they are very, very important today. And coding as a collaboration activity, right? The role of a programmer, which is a lonely individual, all the time coding, we also think in this kind of stereotypes, right? We always think that he is a man. I'm so happy that Laia mentioned that the rest of the members of the panel are women. So I'm going to talk about this role that women are playing in the world of coding. So programming as a collaborative activity, right? Programming and coding. So if you go uh, to a coding corporation, coding is such an, a collaborative activity and you have to cooperate with your mates. And also coding, it is something that really boosts creativity. If you are wondering what is happening in this picture, I'm talking here about creative coding. Why do I show this? Yes, we must break the ice. We need to break the walls of the world of a coding. We don't need a huge infrastructure, big computers, no. This is a coding a workshop. 10 year, 10 hours workshop in the Southern India school without computers, without robots. This uh, gentleman that you see here, it is a Javi expert. And he was uh, one of my teammates that came to me uh, to India. And you can see a project where all the children, they develop, right, a coding and they program and they I don't know if you can see the blackboard. You can see a series of uh, instructions and list on arrows. One step forward, one step backwards, take the object that you have in front of you. So children, they had to put and create some challenges to this physical robot. So you can work in a collaborative manner in many senses. So we don't need a huge technologies. This is the first idea. And another idea that was already mentioned by Laia, I believe that Laia 
has mentioned the many ideas that I wanted to share with you. Well, coding is cross-curricular. Why am I sharing this picture? It was such an, a beautiful project. We created this uh, project that it was called Inventors for Change. We put together schools, we make schools to be connected, but coding is only one of the legs of the table, right? But the coding plays a very important role in these schools. Children from different countries, they are able to get connected, they explore different social issues, aiming at reaching a sustainable goal such as helping refugees and climate change they share ideas through a blog they write in english they want to discuss amongst them they have conversations so they are learning citizenship development they are learning english technology they also have video calls they know each other through video calls and suddenly we reach to a certain stage of this progress this is a school next to girona in the town of salt that is connected in with a rural school in southern India, Santi Baba School, and it is Vainat School in Girona. So suddenly, these uh, boys and girls they work together with another team, and they begin to code, to write a story about what they learn, and to reflect on the refugee crisis they create and scratch a system, they draw uh, the different characters of the story, and then we have also decoding aspects of mathematics and uh, why uh, they have to intervene in a, in a stage, all the different characters of these stories, so it's a very cross-curricular project. So this is an amazing idea, right? Coding, it doesn't have, it doesn't have to be made only in the IT subjects and the classrooms. You can do it in any kind of su subject, such as social sciences, languages, and this is something that we are trying to promote from the uh, Techne Chair. And the other idea that I wanted to share with you, coding and girls, what happens with that? Many, many surveys have shown that girls, when they are teenagers, they have less interest than boys to study scientific studies, right? Related with IT, computing. So depending on the language that you use and also different subjects uh, such as engineering and sciences. This never happened in the primary schools and we don't know why there is this kind of disruption. Why there is this separation? And suddenly, right, families, they play a role and they say to girls, do this, study this or that, and boys, they are, have to study other uh, areas, right? I am a teacher also at the Faculty of Education, and I'd like to make a call for uh, girls to come closer to STEAM, uh, for them to be in a mathematics, science, and for them to study this kind of studies. But 90% and more in education universities, they are girls. Also in nursery schools, they are girls. Despite we made a huge effort for making girls to get closer to technical studies, and I'd like to make boys also uh, to be teachers. I, we really need teachers that must be boys, and also we need boys that in the future should be nurses, right? So why do I pick this picture? We cannot see anything. I don't know what they are doing in the screen, but you know what happens? When you learn coding, there are three girls in this picture in India. When you're learning to code, something that you learn, nothing happens if you are wrong. And these girls, they were uh, coding with Scratch and they were not able to uh, get the effect that they really wanted and they are hiding right so they were trying and they are amazingly engaged and they were having fun they were hidden with their hands the mistake that they made nothing happens right and they trial 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 and error until they finally get a brilliant result this is something that the coding offers to us and the last idea has to do with coding anti-pleasure, the intellectual pleasure. And I want to vindicate the role of Jorge Wallensberg that he always talk about this intellectual joy, which is this relationship between joy, pleasure, 
and fun and the knowledge that stems from the human being curiosity of children boys and girls and laia has mentioned something very interesting coding is like learning a new superpower i do really like this idea it's like your biggest power that allows you to think what computers will offer you and what can you do with computers it is quite a popular sentence by Simon Geiber. So let's think and this idea. We are in a classroom, okay, let's say. And suddenly, kids, they see ants, right? And the ants are at the courtyard and they go back to classroom and they ask the teacher, why ants, they behave this way? And they wonder many, many things, right? And coding will allow these kids a superpower they will be able to simulate to have this ant nest, a virtual ant nest that will allow them to better understand how the world of ants works. And they will be able to go deeper. What ants are, what are they doing? Why do they behave this way? So this is a perspective of the world. It's something that we call the intellectual joy, right? This is the final idea. Just let me show you my final slide. Let me talk about the different projects that we already implemented. We have Digital Edu, the Techni Chair, Inventors for Change, it's over. So this is the idea to put together different schools amongst them for uh, children to be together and to be connected from all over the world and we'll give birth uh, to a next project in the schools in South, uh, the much more uh, complicated schools in South, they will be there. So we also had the European versions, uh, the so-called Inventeur project. I leave you the website. You can find loads of resources, skills, and tools during the pandemic and during lockdown both the projects will offer you many ideas once you uh, are in a lockdown uh, period. Also, Mont Montec, Montessori and Technology, it belongs to Erasmus Plus project, the European project, Erasmus Plus. What would Maria Montessori make today if, he, if she had these digital technologies, right, available, right? Just a minute, Edward. You've got a minute. Okay, just a minute. Okay, cool. And also how to work with the most deprived schools. Montessori began to work in the surroundings of Rome. And also, this is what we do, how to explore, how to use the digital storytelling through coding. Boys and girls, they are able to collaborate and to create different stories. We do it together with other subjects such as the theater and storytelling and the talent maker. It is a very recent project thanks to Assault School. And uh, we finally were able to uh, reach an European level grant and it's an European project. So it is a project that is promoting the teacher talent to create uh, maker workshops. And inside these workshops, we are going to have digital capsules that has to do a lot with the creative coding. That's all from my side. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Edward. Now I'd like to give the floor to Nerea de la Riva. Nerea de la Riva, Nerea Yepa, that's uh, her Twitter account. Well, Nerea, she's got a degree on telecommunications at the University of Alcalá de Henares. She's been four times the champion of uh, RoboCoop Olympic Games. Well, sorry to say, she loves robots. She adores robots. She likes to work with the robot's limitations and to go beyond eh? and also to put together Arduino and all the educational aspects of Arduino. So she's an example to follow. She picked a scientific career, a technical career. Uh, she's passionate about this uh, robotic uh, contest. She had loads of fun as a participant, but also as an organizer of this contest. 
and she is now on the other side and she's trying to give back all the energy that she got from these concerts and robotics because she wants to spread the message and to share the passion that she has with the students. Nerea, you've got the floor. Go ahead. Vale. Let's share with us your ideas. Ver, Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Let me know if you see my presentation. ¿Sí? Yeah. Vale, genial. Crystal bueno, pues muchas gracias Thank por you. la introducción. Eh, el resumen yo creo que ha quedado más o menos claro, pero pues sí, yo empecé clear, a right? programar hace yeah, rato cuando tenía 13 años. Coding when I was Entonces, years pues en este punto he visto suddenly, todo este reto desde el punto de vista de un estudiante, de un profesor o profesora. Journey, y ahora pues desde aquellos que desarrollamos las herramientas que luego sirven en la clase. Así que bueno, a veces se me mezclan ahí un poco los, los puntos de vista, pero también es muy, muy interesante el haber pasado por todos views, ellos. ¿no? Y todavía sigo en un punto en el que he sido más tiempo estudiante que, que empleada de, de aquí, y eso ayuda, ¿no? Porque right? creo que estoy muy so conectada con lo que es el usuario, el usuario final de aquí, que he estado siempre conectada con el final de aquí. Así que bueno, ahora mismo mi trabajo en Arduino consiste un poco en dirigir lo que son estas colaborações con otras empresas educativas internacionales with other educational corporations and companies at an international level. We share what we do in other countries. I've been working in this sense for more than two years. I've been in Arduino for more than six years, always in the education field. In the next picture, okay, I think that talks a lot about myself. I've never been a teacher. I've never been trained as a teacher, but I always love to work in the education field. As I mentioned before, I picked a technological career, but suddenly I realized maybe this is not my thing, and coding allowed me to live the life I have today, and but suddenly I said to myself, maybe I didn't match here, right? But little by little, we had loads of contests we used, and we had loads of seminars we taught children, and Y yo creo in the que end, I realized that código, there was a community a when talking about coding and the education of ¿no? coding, the open source tools are so important to mundo, us. You can get support hacer, from all, all mundo, ¿no? wherever you need, right? So that's when we took off and we had a processor which was huge. If something went wrong, we didn't know what to do. And suddenly we used Arduino and it was a much easier to work with Arduino. We put an Arduino in the engine and we tried to solve the mistakes that we had in the engines and in different ways. That's how we made possible this coding to be easier. It was very difficult in the past because we uh, produce and, and we build robots that play soccer and they, had, they need to know where to score going forwards, going backwards, all the interactions. It was so complicated when you work with the 14-year-old kids that want to code. It was very difficult and suddenly we realized that the things were simpler than expected. Suddenly we wanted to reach other students. We created an association uh, with the 250 nada, students, no and well, at the end of the day, we didn't know how to teach at all. That's why I'm talking about my past. Because, uh, well, the first day I was in the classroom, well, it was a mess. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I, uh, to me, coding uh, was not a problem to me. It was the behavior of uh, those students there. Uh, I was 16 years old. I was too young when I began to teach to these uh, kids, right? And little by little, step by step, uh, we realized what uh, children love. And then finally, we reached to the conclusion that it was very important to get connected con problemas reales, ¿no? porque yo no tenía ni idea de, de cómo hacer este tipo de cosas, problem, de cómo motivarles para que me hiciesen caso, porque ellos lo que querían hacer era lo que, lo que ellos querían ir really Entonces, bueno, esto, eh, mm, lo que ellos querían ir ya. Entonces, bueno, esto fue algo inmediato, lo que me llevó a hacer right y now. quería tocar un poquito... And 
well, este tipo de herramientas que descubrí un poco sobre la marcha antes de empezar a contar un poco más lo que desde, desde Arduino en ese punto pues les preguntarles a ellos so, qué querían hacer little, 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 over what were their cosa, projects ¿no? Entonces, and each and every student they wanted to do different things the way I had to motivate y, them y and to instill some inspiration for them to be attentive and to pay attention in the classroom was through making and experiencing and suddenly from scratch we had this project this project which is a city project because they wanted to build a smart city they voted for that and inside this smart city we had loads of inclusive ideas. We had students that were uh, drawing for an hour no the crossbow. They were motivated tampoco, no? of drawing. I didn't force them to change que, what they really wanted to do. They had to respect the others una, and the others had to do what they really wanted to do. It was cool, right? All the process, it was so cool. When you suddenly saw that boy that was drawing the crossroad and, well, and the girl was drawing the light, well, suddenly we had a magic moment and then ahí, I told them oh do pero, you want to learn how to make lights no? to el, el no switch on and switch off no okay idea, let me teach you pues I was not a teacher so I had to observe them I had to listen to them I had to adapt to the different bases that they had and the learning process and when we stopped they listened to me I had to moderate all the sessions and this made me to go towards the educational world. I studied electronics, right? And after that, I went to the university. I was teaching for quite a few years and suddenly when I reached the university, I said to myself, well, my God, this is going to be so tough. It's going to be hard. How to teach physics to these kids? It was so difficult anyway. But at the end of the day, what I really wanted was to use such a complex aspect, the area that uh, compleja, to me de, was de complicated to teach and to convey to the niña, kids niños, that would make me demás. to bueno, abandon como luego the uh, situation, para que, para but que finally I was able to quiere, simplify ¿no? this for them and for myself. For myself. That's, That's why I finished my studies, otherwise Entonces, I would never finish my university studies. So little by little I began to work together with Arduino, I got in touch with David, one of the co-founders, Uh, he lives in diría, here in my city in Zaragoza, and I told him I want to create something uh, no se te powerful. I want to have no tools for you when you bueno, go pues to the university como, como, como to be ready no? and to get ready and to study. I went to Sweden for six months. This was my idea, but in the end I was there for six years. I just came back last summer from Sweden. I worked there with other teams. I worked virtually with them right now, but I carry on working with my Arduino, sweet um, mate. Atrás, eh, and going bueno, backwards, if I talk to you about Arduino, what's Arduino cómo, cómo and how, este lado, ¿no? when, cosas, what we do, claro, right, from this side, creador, uh, what we do from this side, and how, what, because at the end of the day, we want to motivate, motivate kids to create something with Arduino. Suddenly, you have the teacher in the middle of the process, and this is something that we always try to improve, the teaching skills. Something, it is to create a tool. Another thing, it is a teacher to feel comfortable with our tool. So we have three main axes, and these different axes, they have different tips. This is what we mentioned before when we talked about interactive designers, and the reason why we created Arduino, it was because the designers, they needed design studies uh, with interactive projects. The students, they didn't know anything at all about electronics and coding, and suddenly they thought about these tools, and many people wanted these tools. They really wanted them, and this is what we do, right? In this maker access. So we have a teacher, which is the leader of the session. He is ready, she's ready. He takes this device, the other device, this plastic piece, this tool, and 
but the majority of these educational studies, right, educational situation, this does not represent the majority of cases. We've been working for more than 16 years together with David that is working in the education access, and suddenly we witnessed that there were other needs that need to be satisfied. So we need to standardize the procedures and to put everything inside the classroom. I also work in the educational access, and that's what we did. We need to set the difference of giving you a plate, good luck, bye, I leave you to different pieces, right? No, we need to know how to implement everything in a school. And the other axis has to do with the IoT, the professional axis. This has to do with the connection with the uh, manufacturers, with the industry, with the real world, to use our platform for a specific purpose. So we train beforehand, then you have the education, we have the training, you get your support, you have this creative uh, part, you are able to code, you are able to create what you really want to do, to create your libraries, and finally you are able to earn your bread with this profession. This is something that I experienced myself. I believe that in my shoes. So at the end of the day, this is the last step with the world of manufacturing. This is the connection also with the Internet of Things. So coding, it's not only understand how do we behave, we behave with computers, but also how computers behave with us and among them. This has to do with the Internet of Things, absolutely. And 16 years ago, they had this amazing idea to create this tool, which was an easy tool to use, and this allowed me to better understand how a robot works. Today, we are evolving in this sense, right? So we are broadening the knowledge inside the area of the tools, and this is something that I really wanted to improve, I could contribute a little bit more from a tool perspective. And I really wanted to share with you what's the Internet of Things. What are we working with the Internet of Things? How we are improving the Internet of Things? Many things that we are doing in Arduino have to do with the IoT cloud. It is an Arduino cloud. You can put different variables. You have thousands of devices interconnected all over the planet. So this will allow us to have a much more collaborative Collaborative uh, coding. It is something important right now, right? During these pandemic times, you have an online device, you can get connected through the Internet of Things, and another possibility will make that students at home they will be coding in a simultaneous manner, different devices. So I don't know if you can see in this video. <laughs> Well, you don't need to see the whole video for you to capture the main idea, but what are we doing in this video, in this clip, in this Arduino cloud? We are creating different variables that are not very, very complex, right? You have a different objects that you can pull through. You can uh, have the temperature in Japan, and you can reflect in a colorful light that you will have at home, right? This is the Internet of Things. We can broaden the information all over the planet. We can get interconnected, and you can do the opposite, right? The IoT cloud, you can have it in your phone, and you control the shades in your home, the curtains. So this is the program that you can do in this uh, third activity when you start to work with Arduino on how to make an engine to move. So at the end of the day, this is the same platform with the different tools that really talks in itself. It talks about the different uh, interconnected devices. So this is in a nutshell the idea I wanted to share with you guys. I hope that you understood and any other questions I will have, I'll be there with you. Thank you. Fantastic, amazing. Thank you so much, Nerea. Now we'll give the floor to Carolina. What a pleasure, Carolina. I had the pleasure to meet Carolina many years ago. To me, it's like a pioneer uh, that belongs to the uh, teaching community in uh, Catalonia. She's such a handsome uh, woman 
trying to put uh, coding, physical coding, com the maker world uh, to bring everything in public schools. Uh, she works in a high school in Belviche at the outskirts of Barcelona. And, but she's never satisfied. She wants always more and more. She's not only working with her high school students beyond that, she also belongs to the managing team of the STEAM CAT. This team that allows us to keep on going. She works in the creative part. She's trying to push technology, arts, mathematics, and to bring all these disciplines together. And, you know, Carolina, she's always in all the fairs, in the different seminars. She's always sharing this amazing curiosity that she owns and the temper, the passion that she's got towards this project, right? Carol, you've got the floor. Cool, thank you. I'm getting ready, getting ready, almost done. Okay, no problem. Now, yes, now we can see your amazing presentation. Yeah, just a second, bear with me, bear with me. I'm quite nervous now. As I will say to my students, what is important? The important thing is not to have problems, it's how to solve problems. I hope that my presentation will is seen. Okay, can you see it? Okay, cool. Let me say is something, one of the tricky uh, problems that I will have as the final speaker, it is that many of the ideas that I wanted to share with you have been mentioned before. Okay, this will make things easier. This is good because this means that we all agree. Let me tell you something. Let me confess that no one taught me coding. I am an architect and this single and the only relationship that I had with computers uh, was when I learned calculation. So very low level of creativity. I'm a self learner. I learned scratch and scratch for Arduino. I learned coding thanks to these both tools. I'm a very creative person. I am a curious person. Therefore, I was able to keep on going and to learn on a regular basis. I was able to see what are the values of creative coding. I think that I can reach this, to the same conclusions as Laia and Eduard, but maybe my way was a little bit, let's say, more common to other human beings. Okay, I wanted to sh share with you this image of STEAM. I know that you all know that STEAM, it is an educational approach that aims to define new relationships between students and the learning processes. We'll know what does this letter means. These letters mean a very vital thing for learning science, technology, art, engineering, the use of technology, devices, computers, robotics. But what happens with this E? Laia said that there is a lack of knowledge, right? Uh, about engineering. We don't know what the E, this E, it's full of stereotypes. I don't know why do we have this E in the STEAM because uh, if we said without this E, we would say STEM, engineering, something that belongs to science. It is a very difficult and complicated thing. Many people working with the STEAM tool, the E, many people do not know what does the E mean. Engineering comes from being a genius. And when you talk about being a genius, the perception that you can have, it's a very different it's not a strict thing. It's not something difficult. You can be a genius because we as human beings, we are engineers. When we are kids, we 
like challenges, we like to find solutions because being a genius allows us to combine what do we know, what we can imagine, what we will be able to have and to do. Why? Because we want to offer an answer to problems in this real world. So we like to be problem solvers. Nowadays world, it's a digital world and everything is codified. We as teachers, we have the obligation to make students to be aware and to be critical, to use the STEAM technology. But we don't want to have the students to be users because they will be slaves of technology. I want to share you this image of this kid playing with a robot. Is that enough? This is a question that I made to myself as a secondary teacher. Is it enough to play with robots or to be able to create robots? We are living now the fourth industrial revolution. We all know the main pillars of this industrial revolution, the internet of things, the AI, big data, uh, virtual reality, VR, and the augmented reality, the digital manufacturing, so on and so forth, right? Etc. We, as adults, we began this fourth revolution, but who will be the responsible to develop this fourth industrial revolution? It must be young people. That's why we must thank Arduino because Arduino opened a very big door offered us as a huge tool, offered us the possibility to be creators. We are very, very tiny, tiny individuals, but we can create technology and our students must know that this kind of coding system exists. So we should do it. Let's go for it. As you mentioned before, my dear colleagues. So let's create this coding system. Why? Coding for the sake of coding will make coding to be something very abstract. And it fits meaningless to students. Why are we coding? Here we have the different uh, sustainable goals. I do believe that engineering has a lot to do with these sustainable goals. This is the main objective and goal of STEAM perspective, okay? Now, if you allow me, I must confess that we are creating uh, an aspect of, of coding which is uh, quite mundane. Uh, here you have, you have uh, my students. They are very, very happy. And it was so fun, but little by little, they wanted to study something different, right? They were happy because they won the championship, but they studied different things. So many trends today are using coding, physical computing and robotics can be very satisfying because you are making things to happen. And when you make things happen, you feel like powerful. If things are too much easy, if we then set a relationship with our educational goals just for the sake of fun, I think that we are not reaching we are not reaching what we really want to get, at least from my perspective, which is the coding perspective. And uh, how do we have to code? Okay, we don't know. Uh, this is a question that I made to myself many years ago. We have loads of guests and many people listening to us. They work in high schools and we have different uh, feelings, right, in relationship with this idea. Some people, they say that it's a very hard thing to learn, 
But on the other hand, gosh, we have such an amount of uh, platforms, such an amount of uh, languages and programming languages that will make you to show that coding is such an easy thing, right? So this made me to talk about Tewood Popper, which was the creator of Logo and the principles of creative learning, which is the low floor, high ceilings and wide walls. So this um, means that uh, tools such as Scratch and Microbit will allow you to start uh, coding from a physical perspective to get your results. But this doesn't mean to be there all the time. As we usually say, the ceiling is very high. And how to reach this ceiling? Well, you have different ways to reach a bigger level. And this made me to think about kids when they build bridges and maybe when he'll get older, he will be an engineer. So he will be able to help human beings to solve transportation issues and obstacles. Okay. I don't want to talk about an, any specific uh, platform, but I like these three logos a lot. I love them. They were very inspiring tools to me. I didn't know anything about coding, and now I'm talking about creative programming. So these are my dear friends, right? I do code with them. And I'd like to conclude telling you that programming is not only language. Language is just a technique. I learned programming thanks to Scratch. I don't have any problem a lot to uh, program with Arduino or other different codes, because the important thing it is to create the algorithm and the mindset structure that you need to solve through uh, programming and specific issue that you have in front of you, because creation and creativity they have the same origin, right? The etymology is the same. And in order to conclude, let me tell you that programming does not have to use always uh, computers. Means can be very different. We have loads of activities, thousands of examples with non-connected programming cases. These examples were made by some teachers. We have a single challenge, and you can see the different answers made by different individuals. All of them are correct, and this is something that Edward mentioned before. This is an amazing thing. It is very difficult to say to your students, hey, it's not bad, because anything that we'll be able to do, it comes from your creativity, and it will be always great. That's all, thank you. I'm done, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm done, I'm done. Thank you, thank you, Carolina. Okay, now I'd like to give the floor to Elena Berche. Elena Berche, she's a teacher at St. Jordi School. She's a teacher since 2009. She's a Google trainer. She's been a word with a mobile learning award uh, that was given by M schools. She's amazing. She's uh, passionate about storytelling and the English training. She's got a degree in the primary a license in music and in English. So everything that has to do with human sciences, arts and creativity, well, she really embodies all these areas. So Elena, you've got the floor up to you. Tell us, talk about your adventure. Thank you very much, Laia. We're a weird situation. Okay, I'm gonna try to share with you. I think that you can see it now, okay? Cool. Okay, can you see? Is it good? 
I don't see you. I don't see you. Do you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Well, yes. I'm delighted. We talked all about storytelling and how to use the coding, not only uh, to code for the sake of coding. We want the kids to be creative. We don't want them to be consumers anymore. They don't have only to consume contents. They must be content creators. When I was called by M schools, I said, wow, I'm so happy. I am very, very grateful to be amongst you guys and to talk about creative coding. And how do we make this to happen? Let me talk about the four projects that were developed in my school. We began with this project that it was titled Once Upon a Time for uh, children's education. We wanted uh, kids to share their stories and, uh, through many classrooms and sessions. They were the ones that told the story. It seems very easy, but the first day when I work with uh, primary school students, well, my God, Nerea, it happened the same with that you suffered. I was with my book. I wanted to tell them story, and suddenly they start crying. They started crawling on the floor. I don't know what happened that day. I was 22 years old, and I said to myself, I don't know. Maybe I. It was a mistake. At the end, what I really wanted was to teach them what can they do. You go in the classroom, you get there, uh, you have the book, you want to read the book, but you want to know what are the students' expectations. I didn't know how to do it and how to detect the students' expectations. But in the end, we created this uh, project, uh, 10 session a project. We work with different tales with robotics and crafts, three, four, five-year-old kids, they told us the story in English. It's an amazing project. I'll offer you my links. This was a picture in France. Okay, anyway, here you'll find all the materials that we developed so you can have access if you wish. Another step forward, okay. We began to work with the primary uh, kids for them to learn English. They had to be the ones to use English words and English expressions. And the name of the project, it's titled Filming English. So they are the ones that make the movie. They create their own stories. We work with an iPad, with tablets, with stop motion with the materials and devices that we had in school. And then we have the third project, which is the storytelling robots. What did we do in this project? We wanted the students to create the different stories with robots. We wanted them to create robots, robots that will be able to tell stories, right? The robots will be the ones to tell us the stories. And another one, it is another project called Genius Hour. We work with uh, micro bits, with make makeys, and uh, many other pieces and devices. And they think about what they really love. And suddenly we have a student that loves cars. So let's make a team. Who loves cars? Okay car teams what's the problem that, that we can see in a car i don't know maybe they will tell you they pollute a lot okay so okay let's try to find a solution to the pollution challenge this is what we do in this genius hour okay so these are all projects for students to use english and to communicate together to have fun and we want them to feel the need to use English and to talk English. And sometimes, yes, we work with the curriculum contents and we work with the books such as sports, food and vocabulary as we traditionally learned, right? In the past English, but not only through a book. We want the students to make something with language, with English. So in the end, they are able to create their own project, right? 
One of the projects that we have is this one. It's in Star Wars, Star Wars sword with the micro LEDs, uh, LEDs, and uh, different. It's like a toy, but it's not. They had to test it thousands and thousands of times to have this uh, tube and to put it inside the handle. So we work with values, mathematics, physics. I really liked the previous conference. Uh, Mariona, in the previous session, she said that we must celebrate complexity. It's very easy to get in a classroom in a primary school and to say, hey, let's manufacture a robot. We'll be working with this robot for a month. Sometimes we have the feeling that we are losing time. We will, I don't know, we could uh, take advantage of time uh, developing mathematic skills. And sometimes we feel that we lose time producing a sword. It's quite a complex thing to produce these kind of toys and materials, but at the end of the day, you are working a lot and you're working and developing different subjects, matters, disciplines. So I really like the idea that you mentioned before. Let's mix all the disciplines, all the subjects, because at the end of the day, we will find our inner power and this magic of the cross linked matters, knowledges, and to create things from scratch. Let me talk to you about storytelling robots. This is quite an interesting project, how to create tales and stories through a robot. We created this air block, it is a magnet robot. It can be a drone, it can be a boat. Uh, we uh, wrote some stories through an application an app that it's called Tuntastic, and we divided it in three parts. We had a QR code, and we had this air block device, and we look for the code. The next part of the story. It can be at the beginning, in the middle of the story, at the end of the story. If it was the final part of the story, he had to create the previous part of the story. If it was in the middle of the story, they had to create a beginning and an end of the story. So we together in a creative manner, they were able to create a new story. We divided it into groups and some of the groups, they uh, created a different story and the other group created another story. It's a cool project because they put their own voice and together with Bebop, we worked with different colors. We put different QR codes they could touch it and suddenly they uh, had an image and an image appeared and they had to say they had to say how the person in the image felt and how did they feel when they see a person with this feeling right so if they if it was a happy person they jumped this is what Nerea said. It was difficult to control them and to make them to behave. So you need to be crazy, but you need to control this craziness. And also we work with Rocky coding. We told stories such as this, driving my, my tractor that has a song, driving my tractor in a bumpy road. So we sang this uh, song and we picked the different animals that uh, sang this song. So we used these robots and at the end of the day we had a different motivation for them to use english and also co-spaces i'm a raving fan of a co-spaces we worked the different uh, animals and we told the different features of the animals and well sometimes why don't we make uh, the an ar world and to offer an answer and depending on the answer the animal will uh, make something or another thing so this is magic and we have it thanks to coding so at the end of the day this is what carolina said 
the environments are very similar code spaces environment it's very similar to scratch to scratch to mail code when they know one coding system it's very easy to work with another system so it's very easy so we have this making makey robot we wrote a tail for a student that was blind so he was not able to see but when he touched the monster of colors right uh, we listened the voice of uh, five great students and this uh, five-year-old kid well was able to listen to the story so we used robots and coding to tell stories and uh, to make things funnier we had fun so to speak english is not only a manual thing a thing that you find in your handbook in your book we want students to speak english in the classroom at home many people will say well that's fantastic but how do you assess your students you have tiny groups of students how do you assess them how do you give them grades well you must be aware we have a digital portfolio we have a lab book right the ones with different folders i like the digital portfolio because they can put different videos they can upload all everything that they did uh, in the classroom and okay they must know uh, what we are assessing and why we are assessing the different skills and well at the end of the day we had fun and they will be able also to assess themselves together with their colleagues i really like carolina because i always say to myself and to others any kind of a projects low floors high ceiling this idea i really love it you can start from scratch you can uh, uh i don't know you can end having a sword you can end uh, having a hair dressing saloon wherever so i really like this uh, image right and this scratch tool we can start imagining something we can produce it we try it if it works okay if it doesn't work okay how can we improve it uh, we can share it with the others many many times we had an english game in the classroom with different cards and you know after half hour they played something different we wanted them to practice english but they played something different so this is the same right so this is what we want we want them to keep on creating because at the end of the day what we really want from kids we want children to be able to communicate to work with creative thinking with uh, we want them to collaborate with the others and thanks to coding we can do it we can do it and in order to conclude, let me read this quote from Mitchell Resnick. The best way to promote creativity is to support people working on projects based on their passions. Whether you are a kid or a teacher, if you love Star Wars, why not? Why not to uh, make a sword together with your classmates? always in a playful spirit thank you so much thank you very much for inviting me and for sharing my ideas with you well we were waiting uh, for questions and to share with the participants but well i we don't have a questions for the moment being. So let me ask you something. Okay. The opposite of a creative recording will be to follow the instruction without failing, without being able to change things. So this strategy is not very creative. People making things without being creative, uh, you know, in general terms we don't like it at all we want to be free would love to follow the rules and to learn uh, coding without being creative nobody but from the different strategies to attach to creativity breaking the code playing with uh, error 
also to better know uh, the principles of coding, to explore different algorithms that will offer the possibility to reach and to make what we really want to reach and to make, because I don't know if you want to have like a play role or you should know how to use different tools that will allow you to create this algorithm. How do you make things possible? What's your strategy? Please give me a tip. Give me, uh, let's say, a hacking recipe. Okay, I'll break the ice. No, go ahead, Carolina. You know what? What I really like, it's my students to be wrong. Error, it's fundamental. Because if things go well, for the first time, you never learn and you forget. When you have to make an effort, when you have to find a solution for a tiny problem, right? That's when things are much solid. I really loved a seminar that I had the occasion to participate in. Uh, it was at the MIT, Scratch MIT. I had so much fun. And in each and every topic, uh, we had the part to find solutions to tiny problems. You expected to something to happen and it never happened. So you had to find a way for this thing to happen. It was fun because we didn't react it the same way. We reacted differently. That's all, Edward, you can talk if you want. Yes, if I had to give you an advice, Carolina and Elena, you made a metaphor, low floor, high ceiling, broad walls. I think that it is basic. When you pick a platform, we talked about platform. There are many, many platforms, an infinite quantity of uh, platforms to improve uh, programming. I think that we need platforms with broader worlds. Children, should learn differently. Let's talk about Scratch, which is maybe the most known example. Maybe kids love music and they got hooked to Scratch through music. Maybe they will learn algorithms later on. Others, they love drawing, drawing characters and they get hooked to Scratch things of drawing. We have others that they love coding so we need broader walls. And this has to do with different intelligent varieties and skills. Each and every one of the students will have different ways to get hooked to coding. This is my tip. Thank you. Phenomenal. Let me say something if you don't mind. Go ahead. I do agree with everything that you mentioned before. I always try in a classroom. Always, always let students to present what they do. When I had older students, we have a low diagram, we draw it in the blackboard, maybe the program was drawing a plane, and we had 300 ways to draw a plane, and well, we had different ways of drawing, right, and we presented the way we did it. And then I always kept some time for different teams to show what they did. One of the parts that they had to share in the presentation was to share what it was wrong. Maybe the engine was not very powerful. Maybe the robot was very heavy. So I wanted them to share the problem. Some told, hey, let's put a much more powerful engine or let's have a lighter structure. So this is my tip of advice. This is my advice. Uh, let them talk about what uh, didn't go well. I do agree, Nerea. Yes, because in conclusion, what do we do want? 
we want students to share their mistakes and suddenly they realize hey i could do things this way they can share amongst teams right now with the pandemic it's so difficult but uh, when we look to the screen and when they share amongst them it's uh, very interesting yes thank you another advice that i give you it is to share amongst all a uh, very tiny piece of code if you start working with nine year olds it's very difficult for them to have a uh, support right the fundamentals for them to create so only high ceilings and just create go for it but as an advice let's offer them the fundamentals just a tiny part of a code for them to create afterwards we do have a question uh, from the audience when we talk in the digital world the mistakes can be easily solved but in the digital world and in a in a logical world, things are much more complicated to solve. Well, mistakes can be fatal, right? In an analogical world, but you need to know how to solve, how to find a way to solve your problems and not let this mistake to happen again in your life. I think that when working with education, mistakes are never fatal mistakes. Mistakes are the basis to learn. So we have different tools. Mistakes are basic. As Nerea mentioned before, you must be aware, you must acknowledge that you can share what didn't go well. Because I saw myself in uh, different work situations that uh, things went well at the first chance and this is not reality things never go well the first time and things are never good all the time we can always improve you must accept where did you fail what could you improve and to accept the way things are and then in the real world okay be careful. Maybe we should adapt the kind of mistake to the different development stages I think that while we develop the different skills, mistakes are different. If we are able to master the platform, maybe when they are three years old, they must feel safe and for them to solve the previous problems, right? Y se compran otro LED por otros 10 céntimos, ¿no? Entonces yo creo que siempre intentar que el entorno o el tipo de error que se puede producir sea un poco en conexión con lo que so, ellos tienen en su conocimiento bajo control, ¿no? Pues no es lo mismo <laughs> cuando ya uno have, right? diseña un so, puente, se ha caído, que educativo y lo uh, otro uh, pone igual. Yo creo que en ese punto ya, well, ya uno llega a una madurez donde eso no pasa, ¿no? Pero eso yo creo que se adecuado en el tipo de error al momento. So we need some so on how to get adapted to the different kinds of mistakes. We are reaching towards the end, but let me just thank you all, Elena, Carolina, Eduard, Nerea, thank you so much. Thanks so much for sharing with us your knowledge and uh, from the world of labs, trial, error, experiencing are vital. It is important to open spaces and to offer more room to experiencing in real life. And maybe as a conclusion, when prototypes made by young people in the classroom, prototypes from the public administration should take advantage of them. They should listen to students and to create these dynamics of being interconnected when talking about uh, citizen innovation, everything begins at schools, high schools, with this democratic participation, with a critical mindset, kids, children, students able to understand this real environment, the IoT, the AI, everything is interconnected. 
and boys and girls, they are smart enough, they have the knowledge, the know-how, they understand this technology, which is not anymore a black box. They know how to work with that. They can offer us new proposals. Uh, so we have new alternatives to the GAFAM world, to the world of big corporations. So with this idea in mind, with this huge potential and this huge array of possibilities, this conversation reaches to an end. But to be continued, we'll meet each other through social media, through social events and other activities. And we count on you. We count on the education community and we count on all of the members that belong to our community. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to Soko, to Mobile Team. Thank you guys. That's over. Thank you.